Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. The theme for tonight's program deals with a very important part of our faith that I suppose we take for granted, and that's the importance of knowing what we believe and why. I remember as a young adult Christian reading a couple of books called Know What You Believe and Know Why They Believe, and they had a big impact on my faith journey about 25 years ago. And what's always stuck in my mind from reading those books uh, is this important challenge to us to know what we believe and why. We must not take it for granted. I suppose that's one of the issues we're dealing with tonight is that many of us make the mistake of presuming that we, we learned our faith to a certain level and then we've arrived and think that we have no more need of continuing to feed our faith to challenge our mind, and especially to purify our heart. Uh, it's a constant journey, and we're going to talk about that tonight. We're also going to talk about uh, why we need to know our faith and why we believe, because of the challenges that are put on us tonight. My guest tonight will deal with that issue, not only as a result of his own spiritual journey, but because of the apostolate that he has, John Mardinoni. He, you may have seen him on other programs here in UW10. Oh, no. no. Life on the Rock for an opening segment one time. All right, great. But some of you may have heard him on radio. He's, he's right now the director of Catholic Radio here in... Uh, the general manager of Queen of Peace Radio here in Birmingham. That's right. He used to have a program. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But I want to remind you that you're an important part of this program. Your questions, especially in the second half of the program, are very important. So if you have any questions for John, call us at one 800 2219460 or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. So John, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you, Marcus. I suppose it's this is kind of uh, a payback or a right. uh, first of all, you weren't scheduled for tonight. Right. Uh, this time of year sometimes you have cancellations and you were ready. Well, to jump on board. And I was uh, glad to repay the favor as you were starting to say you were very kind to be a guest on my radio program that I had a couple of years ago on a local Protestant radio station. That's right. that, was so. a, that wasn't exactly preaching to the choir, was it? No, it wasn't. <laughs> it, was, it was very interesting. Yeah, it, was, it was fun being on that with you, yeah. too, and it was a challenge. And I know that that, that radio program had a, a good impact in this area because, as you've shared with me, some of the letters and emails and, right, and relationships that came out of that. And that, uh, that one-hour program on Protestant radio led directly to... Catholic radio coming to Birmingham full time. Yeah. So. All right. Well, that's great. Uh, let me invite you, if you would, to uh, begin our program by giving us some of your spiritual background. Okay. Well, I was uh, born and, and grew up in Huntsville, Alabama, a little north of here, and grew up in a Catholic family. Um, went to uh, Catholic school just in first grade only, and then after that it was public school the rest of the mm -hmm. way. CCD programs after first grade, so I was uh, received uh, first confession, first communion in second grade, and then I was confirmed in fourth grade at age 10. And basically, as, all, as I can remember, my Catholic education stopped wow. after my confirmation. Quit going to CCD after confirmation? Well, I, I didn't quit going, but I couldn't ever remember anything that I learned in CCD, Amen. and I remember <laughs> each year just arguing with my mother, please don't make me go next year. And she finally relented, I think, around eighth or ninth grade. But uh, from there, you know, just grew up, relatively normal childhood that I can, you know, comparatively speaking, and uh, went through high school, graduated high school in 1976, and went off to college at the University of Alabama. And basically, when I went off to college, I, in essence, left the Catholic Church. Uh, quit going to church, you know, when I would be home on the weekends, I would go as under my father's roof, and so you do as he <laughs> says, and that was to go to church, so I did, but uh, my heart wasn't in it, my head wasn't in it, and, yeah. and as I said, basically, I, I, I left the faith, and I probably, uh, when I graduated college, probably didn't go back for, for many years. When you were in college, was it, I mean, this is kind of a redundant question in a sense, but... I mean, my guess is that the group you were in were, like yourself, uh, non-churchgoers mostly? Pretty much. I was in a fraternity at Alabama, and we had a few guys that we called, like, I guess, the, the term at the time, Jesus Freaks. They, they were solid Christians, and you talked to them, and, you know, very nice guys, and I enjoyed their company just like I did the other 
uh, fraternity brothers, but uh, basically yeah, no church, no yeah. thought of God. You know, the only time God's name came up was if it was in a negative way. <laughs> right. What about after college? Did you return to the faith right away? Or? No, I uh, went out and started working, worked in the defense industry in Huntsville for several years. Well, after I got my bachelor's, got my MBA immediately, and then went to work in Huntsville, and just uh, didn't, you know, as, as years went by, on the outside everything looked really good. You know, young, single, good job, good pay, had my own house, I, I was driving a Corvette, which was my dream car. Uh, arrived. You know, yeah, I had arrived. Everything on the outside looked really good, looked really nice. I was a success story, in, according to the world standards. Uh, investing in the stock market, I was even dabbling in the futures markets from mm -hmm. time to time. But on the inside, there was an emptiness, you know, and it just kept growing and growing. And I couldn't really explain it, couldn't figure it out. Not that I really tried, it was more a void yeah. thinking about it. It's just, why do I feel this way? Well, I'm going to go out to the bars Friday and Saturday night, and I won't worry about it. Um, eventually, it reached to the point where I knew something was wrong in my life, and something had to change. And that's when I decided to leave the defense industry and go back to school. I, I had enjoyed teaching. I'd had my finance degree, my MBA. And I said, well, I'm going to go back and get a PhD in finance. And I thought, that'll take care of it. If I change the external circumstances, mm. then that will solve, that will heal this hole inside of me or fill the yeah. hole inside of me in some way, somehow. So that, that's, that's the early part of my journey. And I know that, it, it, I'm sure as viewers know, that that description of your journey it, in many ways fits the journey of so many people. Yes. I mean, it, you and I paralleled very much. You know, I get into solid Lutheran upbringing. When I left high school, left it all behind. College, I left church behind. I mean, it's very, very common. And, um, uh, but this, also this, this emptiness, which St. Augustine tells us is what God puts within us, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and that's our search, but people looking for the answers. So, I mean, you, what you were doing is very, very common, especially people in the 70s and 80s. I mean, it's very common. Right. Our theme for tonight, as we chose earlier, was the idea of the importance of knowing our faith and knowing why we believe it. Uh, if you were to look back then at that stage, there you were, out of college, successful businessman, going back to school, looking for that answer. Uh, remembering then, how many years since you quit your education, your spiritual education, many years? It, I was 10 years old, basically, so it was probably uh, 20 years. All right, 20 years. Did you know your faith? Did you know why you believed it at that point? No, and uh, it, it was, the faith really was not a relevant part of my life. And if you had asked me why did Catholics do this or that, uh, and like I said, I wasn't a practicing Catholic, although I would think of Jesus and God, and I would pray occasionally. I think, uh, uh, you know, if I wanted something, I, God, you know, help me get this. Um, and I thought of myself as a spiritual person. Oh. But uh, the church, the faith, the Catholic faith, had really little, little part of in my life. And, and I couldn't have told you anything about what Catholics did and why. Really, yeah. Yeah, you probably in a memory sense, remembering the way you did things as which actually we'll talk a little bit. It changed a bit in twenty some years uh, yes. by the time. But um, during those years, uh, since leaving the faith, did did the Protestant world have any impact on you? Had you been approached at all? No, not really. I was never uh, approached by anyone. Never evangelized by a Protestant that I can remember. Um, or at least you weren't ready to listen. Not, uh, right. Know, like you said, you knew some of the quote Jesus freaks in college and mm -hmm. people we, I mean that's what we called them from this side if we just knew them we'd know they're just people love the Lord Jesus right but you weren't ready to, to sit down and listen to them no all right well then what opened your heart to start considering the well, church again when I went back to school to work on PhD I went to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and the very first day I walked onto campus I was assigned an office as a PhD student because I was going to be teaching a class or two as well they assigned us this big open room. All the first year PhD students were in it. We called it the bullpen. And I just, I, 
few of us were in there and said, well, what desk do you want? I said, well, I'll take this desk over here. And, and the, my desk that I chose was backed up against these 10 foot tall bookshelves that were jammed into the middle of this room. And on these bookshelves were all these finance and economics books and things like that that had been left behind by previous students. So I stood up on my desk and I start going down and picking out one or two books here or there thinking that this could help me in one of my courses. Got down to the bottom and there were two shelves that were covered by the back of the desk that I couldn't see. So I pushed this old, looked like 1940s old wooden oak desk, pushed it out of the way. And literally the bottom two shelves were covered with dust, cobweb type thing. Uh, and there was one book on those two shelves on the very bottom is covered with dust. I reached down, picked it up, and it was a, a little paperback book, thin little book, maybe 140 pages, something, all about uh, some, the normal Christian life, how to be a Christian. And, and the whole book was on the book of Romans and taking from that how to live a Christian life. And I thought, you know, and looking back on it, I was like, that book was left there for me. It could have been there for years. <laughs> it was left there for me to find. I took it home, and this was before my classes had started, really, so I started reading, read the book that night, all the next day, and I thought, wow, this is incredible. I, I've never seen anything, a whole book on just one book in the Bible. There's not enough in one book of the Bible to write a whole book on, is there? You know, little did I know. So from that, but it, it, but it excited something inside of me. From that, I went down to the campus bookstore and, and bought a book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, which was a Christian apologetic. And that started, as I read that, I started thinking, wow, this guy is, I mean, truth. When, when you read truth, hear truth, it, it does something to you. And I just wanted more and more. So I bought more C.S. Lewis books, probably four or five more, and read them. Then from C.S. Lewis, I went back and there was this book, The Confessions, St. Augustine. And I'm like, well, I've kind of heard of him. Picked it up and started reading and there, you know, our hearts are made for thee, and they are restless until they rest in thee. That, you know, that's the whole of the heart. It yeah, part, part. So I read that, then got into uh, Thomas Akempis, The Imitation of Christ, Fulton Sheen, and on and on. And that year that I was there at the PhD program, supposed to be reading finance and economics and statistics, well, I was reading all this theology, you know, all this about religion and, and spirituality and, and faith, and it just about halfway through the year I realized I'm not supposed to get this PhD and something else I don't know what but I'm not supposed to do this and I ended up getting a job teaching finance for you as a finance instructor at a, a small university here in Alabama University of North Alabama up in Florence and so after that year of the PhD program I moved to Florence and I worked for a year but it right in between from the right before I left the campus I decided to come back and talk to a priest and it was it was literally three four days before I left North Carolina and I went in and I went to confession and went to mass that Sunday and that was my coming back into the church for the first time in 13 years really so you're back you got a toe in the door at least right you're going through confession and you're back in were you back spiritually I was back in the sense that I knew this is where I was supposed to be, but I really didn't know why. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't think about it at the time, but I just knew that the Catholic Church was for me. And I, I had... In fact, I'm wondering at this point, if I had to ask you that question again, did you know your faith and know why you believe it at that point? Absolutely not. You know, there was nothing in the books that I was reading. I was reading books on spirituality, but I wasn't reading books on, on doctrine and on, more, on why the church teaches what it does. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I knew the church teachings, but not why. And would so, you just, let me ask you, would you describe, and describe that coming back to the church as a result of those wonderful books you're reading? Would you describe that as your adult conversion, a conversion of heart at that point, well, coming to Christ? I had, during the, the year when I knew I didn't want to be in this PhD program anymore, and I didn't know where to go, what to do, it was reaching the lowest point. You know, I left my job, I, I'm, yeah. I'm in this PhD program, I don't want to be here, I can't be, I'm not going to be here, I don't know where I'm going to get. God help me. Jesus, give me strength. You know, and I, I can remember standing in the front room in my apartment saying, Jesus, 
I've been making all these plans for my life, all these times, uh, you know, last several years. You know, in business school, you're taught each year, sit down, write out your life, next six months, next yeah, year, next week. Mission statements. And I'd been doing that, and I realized none of those things had come, even, <laughs> even the things one month ahead of time weren't working out. And I just said, Jesus, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I, I'm giving my life to you, and, you know, I'm going to count on you. And it's one of those moments where I, I call it a God moment. And I just felt this burden lift from me. And I still didn't know where I was going, what I was going to do. But a few weeks later, I, a friend of mine who I was from Alabama, he said, I heard about this job at UNA over in Florence. Why don't you look into it? Got that job yeah. like that. You know, and, and came to Florence. And because of my schedule teaching, I was able to go to daily mass. And so I'm going to daily mass. I'm very involved with the parish. You know, and I'm when I on Sundays when I went up to communion, I would have these experiences that I would literally hear the pounding of, of metal on metal, which was Jesus being nailed to the cross, mm -hmm. the hammer hitting the, the nail, and I knew that I was going up to receive Jesus Christ, and I knew you know, what he had done for me, hearing this hammer, so it was like it was an echoing through the hill, hills. And, uh, and I would just start, the tears would just start coming in. And I, I got to where I would sit in the very back pew because I'd receive communion and I'd just put my head down like I was very holy, you know, and walk back. <laughs> well, I was trying to keep people from seeing that they're, I was crying. You know, I couldn't stop and I'd go and kneel down in the back pew and the tears would just flow out of my eyes. Uh, so it was a wonderful experience. I was praying more. Uh, again, my schedule allowed me to, to, to pray, to read more books, and just got really closer to God. But in all of this, I still didn't really know my faith. Was, the, the heart was there, but the head wasn't in it. If someone maybe from outside the church of another Christian tradition had pushed you into a corner and challenged you about your faith, you might have a hard time answering some of their... Yeah, and, and I did actually have a time where I, I met with a, a minister of a particular dom denomination that uh, my some friends of mine were going to, and they had said, well, why do you Catholics worship Mary? And I was like, I've never even heard. What are you talking about? You know. <laughs> so I went and kind of got my goat up, and I went and talked to this pastor. I said, well, what are you teaching these people? And I didn't know anything about where anything was in the Bible, but he would say things like... Uh, well, we believe what's in here. We don't believe what's not in here. And I said, well, so you believe in slavery. That's in there. Paul was returning a runaway slave. And he just kind of switched the subject. He said, well, for instance, he said, uh, the one I remember the best is, he said, in one of Paul's letters, it said, men should not wear their hair long because the word, Greek word for long hair is the same as the Greek word for homosexual, which I don't know if that's true or not. But I looked at him. I said, so long hair on men means homosexuality. He said, absolutely. I said, so you're telling me Samson was a homosexual? Because you know, <laughs> Samson had long hair, and he switches. So I kind of engaged in apologetic, but just from logic just, and reason, not from knowing my faith and yeah. why, or mm -hmm. from scripture. Um, so, but, and, and I, I was at that point at that time, I was what I call a cafeteria Catholic. You know, this Pope guy in Rome, why do I have to listen to him? Why can't women be priests? You know, what's the deal with contraception? Who cares? It's not hurting anybody. Why, why, what's the big fuss? So I knew what the church taught, but again, you didn't know, the didn't know why. Or the theology and, and, and I thought I was being a good Catholic because yeah. I was, like I said, daily mass, real involved, but I didn't know the faith. So what got you? What challenged well, you at that point? Because a lot of Catholics, that's where they stop. You know, I, I remember once reading in a one of a, I've mentioned this on the program uh, before. Gregor Lagrange, a great spiritual writer, says it's a shame when the majority of Christians never get beyond the first conversion. Right. First conversion is baptism. I mean, people just stop. Yeah. But uh, by God's grace, others get nudged along. Right, and that's I ended up here in Birmingham about uh, 10, 11 years ago, and almost immediately upon coming into town, getting a job at a bank uh, as an investment in, in the investment department. Um, getting into a parish at work and in the parish I started getting questions about why does the church do this? Why do we do that? And I don't know why people were asking me. And, uh, but it was God was 
putting me in situations where I had to do something. Somebody so could I, put a sign on your back and said, kick me. Right? I guess, yeah, yeah. It's kind of almost like that. And yes, this guy. So I've always been good at doing research. I remember my dad, whenever I would ask him a question, he said, there's the wor World Book Encyc Encyclopedia, go look it up. So I'm always used to looking things up. So I went, bought a book of canon law. Well, okay, this is why we do this. This is why you have to have first confession before first communion. It says so right here and, and uh, all these other things. And, and uh, one day went into the local Catholic bookstore here and I said, is there something that it just explains why Catholics do what we do? And the woman there, a uh, volunteer, she said, well, she said, here's a tape I hear is pretty good. I haven't heard it myself, but several people have told me it's good. Well, it was Scott Hahn's conversion tape. <laughs> and when I listened to that, it was, uh, like we say here in Alabama, it was like throwing gasoline on a fire. You know, just whoo, <laughs> took off. It's like, wow. So I started buying Scott Hahn tapes, right and left. Spent, you know, I, I met him one time here. I told him, I said, I don't know how many bedrooms you have in your house, but I paid for one of them. <laughs> um, and then from Scott Hahn, got into, you know, Tim Staples, uh, Ignatius Press, got on their mailing list and started getting all these books and, and really getting into apologetics which I view as, as a, not a be all and end all, but a tool for learning your faith and learning how to defend the faith with Catholic and with non-Catholic because inside the church there's a lot of people who don't know, as, as I didn't, what the faith is all about and why we do the things we do. Yeah. So from there, just started building up and getting into apologetics, things happen, a series of coincidences happen, and I ended up with a, uh, a one-hour week Catholic apologetics program on local Protestant radio. And I, I thought, this is nuts. I remember signing the contract. I went out to my car and I looked up at the heaven and I said, what have you done to me? You know, why? I don't know anything about radio. I'm not, I don't know apologetics well enough. I was basically a novice in apologetics. I don't know it well enough to be on radio doing that. I'm going to make a fool out And I just remember, I said, you better not leave me now. You got me into this, you better stick with me, <laughs> which, of course, he does. Um, got that program on the local radio station. Like I said, that led to, uh, I did that for a year, uh, very interesting times, but it, I got good feedback from both Catholics and Protestants, Protestants calling and saying, we never knew that's why Catholics yeah. did that. You know, we appreciate you being on there. I, I got called names. I'm a heretic. I'm an abomination. You know, all these things. But I would always look to those people and say, well, let's talk about it. You know, never return anger with anger. Um, and, and very good things came of that. And, and like I said, I, st I was still kind of making plans like, okay, I'll continue working in the bank, do this. Um, all that, when I got into apologetics and got on the radio, all of a sudden I was an authority because I was on the radio. I had a radio program. So I started being invited to give talks to these local groups here, Catholic groups. And then I gave some talks at my parish one summer, which a friend of mine here at EWTN recorded. I thought, well, maybe somebody might like them. And if they want cassette tapes, would you record them? And he did. And several months later, EWTN played them. I came home one Sunday morning from, from church. And they played them on their Sunday morning program called Top of the Week. And there were like 17 messages on my answering machine. I said, what is this about? And calls from California, New York, Michigan, Florida, people wanting copies of my talks. Uh, oh my gosh, this is incredible. It's like, I, yeah, I would step back and this is bizarre. Me, John, people calling for my tapes, my talk. And uh, that one thing led to another, and, and uh, I got in touch with the folks at Queen of Peace Radio, had a station in Jacksonville. I told them, I said, you know, I've got this program in Birmingham, but I have people in Huntsville where I used to grow up, where I, where I grew up, used to live, who want this program. They heard about it. How do I do that? He said, well, John, we're looking at buying a station in Birmingham and at Huntsville. Can you help us? I said, sure. So. Huntsville didn't work out, but we helped them buy a station here, uh, talked to some people, and they asked me to be the general manager. I said, I don't know anything about radio. They said, well, you don't have to. It runs itself. You just, you know, you do your apologetics, you answer questions, do the public relations, fundraising, et cetera. And that's, and that's how I got to it. It's kind of funny when you look at it, where 
It's like you were saying, you, you put your five-year plan, your 10-year plan back when, and God's daytimer is always a bit different than yes, ours. It, it is, it is, uh, absolutely. He always knows better uh, how we can use the gifts that he's given to us if we're willing to say, like you said, Lord, you know, whatever you want to do with my life, you know, please open the doors. If you look back on your journey, your, your, uh, the, the pattern of your journey is similar to many and you know, brought up, given a, a certain amount of information, and then you go through the rites of passage of the church. And then you come back to the church, and then you re reacquaint yourself with the, the rites and passages of the church and become part of it. But yet there's also this aspect that becoming uh, better acquainted with your faith, knowing it better, wasn't just a head trip, it was also a heart trip too. Right. Talk about how now as a Catholic, coming to know your faith better and why you believe it helped you in your spiritual journey, how important that is. Right, well that's um, getting into why the church teaches what it does, exposes you to 2,000 years of the early church fathers, Aquinas, Augustine, whether you're reading them directly or not, that's, mm -hmm. that's what flows through, the threads flowing through the doctors of the church, the saints. Well, Thomas Aquinas isn't a saint because he was smart. He was, he's a saint because he was holy. And the more you learn up here, you know, uh, the way I've, I've put it before is, um, you know, as I learned what my faith taught, and it helped me understand it, it helped me get things from here into my heart. Yeah. You know, the more I knew, the more truth behind the truth, the more truth behind the teachings helped it go from, okay, this is not just A, B, C, and, you know, it's all on the surface. It's way below. It's so deep. I've heard people say, you know, regarding Scripture, but, it can, you know, it's the teachings of the church as well. Some of them are shallow enough that a child can wade into but they're also deep enough that an elephant can drown in, you know, and that's how it was for me. The more I learned, I felt the deeper I was going. And the more I learned about certain doctrines, the more I learned about the importance of prayer. Mm -hmm. And the more scripture would tell me, pray, the more the fathers of the church would say, pray, all the saints would say, pray. So I'd pray, you know, and, and the more I pray, the more graces Jesus bestows on you. And, and it just opens up things that you never thought were there, you never knew were there. And, uh, you know, I, I, when, one time there was a big snow in 93 here in Birmingham. We got snowed in for a weekend, like I think a foot and a half or something, maybe two feet in some places. And I just bought a book on Mary, True Devotion to Mary, St. Louis de Montfort. Most books on religion I'll read, I'm, I'm, I'm a very slow reader, and I'll, I'll read a page on it and I'll go, whoa, what was that about? And I'll have to think about it. But this book just, it read like a novel. And, and all these teachings on Mary that, you know, I knew Mary and I knew the apologetics for it. Why, okay, Mary's, n you know, not a goddess and why we have to, why praying to Mary is okay. I could give you the apologetics. But I wasn't praying my rosary. Okay. I wasn't turning to Mary all that often in prayer. And I was kind of, still kind of thinking, well, should I, shouldn't I? Reading St. Louis de Montfort, Jesus is the sun, Mary is the moon, reflects the sun's light. You know, God gave us Jesus through Mary. Why not go back through Mary to God? And I, you know, things like that that um, just really made an impact on my spiritual life from learning why the church teaches what it does. Yeah, and I want to make sure the audience understands that we kind of gloss over this, but uh, you can tell by the Bible that oh, old John has a, become a good student of scriptures. Unless you sent your Bible to a buffing factory, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I know that the one of your part of your rebirth of faith was the discovering the beauty and the power of scripture. Diving into scripture yeah. and just reading, and uh, you know, starting with with the New Testament, yeah. and just read that through a couple times, and, st and then you know, going from there, and with the little notes in here that say that reference, okay, this. This reference is Isaiah, or this reference is Jeremiah, and going back and reading Isaiah and Jeremiah, and just, and then again, listening to the tapes from the Scott Hans, the Jeff Cavins, watching EWTN, watching the folks you have on your show, and just sitting and thinking, oh, all this beauty in here, 
that I never knew about. And you know, as a Catholic growing up in the in the '60s and, and early '70s, mid '70s, Scripture wasn't you know even you know they read it in church, but I I never realized never the whole mass the, is all out of yeah, from Scripture. So much for you know. So it reminds us of that wonderful balance between theology and prayer. You right. know that that what we know. And, and, and why we believe what we do is directly connected to our our piety, our prayer life, and we must we got to keep them in balance. We got to keep growing yeah. in both. Yes, and never, in either we should never think that we've arrived. And uh, we'll, we're going to take a break, uh, but we recognize that we live because we love Jesus and His Church. Where there's always that spiritual battle to challenge us in those two areas, yeah. to challenge what we believe and to challenge our spiritual life. And we need to know and feel strong in it so we feel confident to stand before God and to receive His graces and then to reach out and love to others. Absolutely. Let's take a break. Go back in just a moment with your questions for John about his journey of faith and about our importance to know what we believe and why. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest is tonight, John Mardinoni. 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 Um, I want to get it right. I always get these uh, Italian names. It takes about eight or ten times. Yeah, it actually, it could be what? Uh, Mar Mar Martignoni. Martignoni. All right. So talking about his, his return to the church, and really a big part of that was the conversion of the heart by grace, and then you might call it the hunger for and thirst for righteousness, for there's for, for truth, for truth and, and that was a gift of God's mm -hmm. grace and then a great variety of things keep, kept feeding that. And all those things are actually clues and signs of that second conversion that the spiritual writers talk about. Usually one of the greatest uh, fruits of that is this hunger yes. for more, for more of God and to know more. Let's take our first email. Uh, this comes from <clears throat> Jeremy Vrana from Arlington, Virginia, Marcus and John, when you discuss the faith with non-Catholics, what is your favorite topic to begin with? Do you find that any particular topic is more effective in making others consider the reasonable reasonability of the Catholic Church? Do you have a favorite topic to begin well, with? Well, I don't, I don't really, basically what I do, um, 1 Peter 3.15, about always be prepared to make a defense. Yep. I let the other folks come to me and whatever it is they want to talk about, that's my favorite topic. Yeah. Because with you know all the branches of Protestantism, all the different types of and personalities of individuals, there is uh, you know some people may have difficulty with Peter, with the po or Peter is the first pope, and difficulty with the pope, or difficulty you know Catholics aren't Christian even. You you, you have Mary as the fourth person of the. Trinity or quadrinity, however they want to put it, uh, uh -huh. and things like that. So I determine what I'm going to start off talking about by what people good. say to me. Very good. And I, I'm kind of a Johnny One Note because no matter where they begin, I usually bring it back to the issue of sola scriptura. You know, it's <laughs> well, authority, authority, authority is the ultimate exactly issue, right. and that's why I tell everybody, eventually you're going to get to the topic of authority yeah. because. That is the topic or the uh, problem that non-Catholic Christians have with the Catholic Church, bar none. That's the main problem. Right. So you can start off in all these other places. Eventually, you come to the question of authority. All right. Very good. Let's take our first caller, Patrick from uh, Kansas. What's your question for us tonight, Patrick? Yeah, about eight months ago, I picked up a... Uh I picked up a book called Surprised by the Truth, Yo. and I started to uh, I started to read that and. Uh, well, over the course of the last, you know, seven or eight months, I made my way back to the church, and I, I find now I've reached a certain spiritual plateau. Yeah. It seems that growth is, has stopped to a certain degree, and, you know, it's really a hump I'd like to get over. 
Patrick, thank you. Very, actually very common for people on the journey. Absolutely. I, I tell people there were times when I would actually come up and get over some difficulty. And I would sit back and pat myself on the back and say, oh, John, I'd look back and say, look at that mountain you just climbed. And then I would kind of turn around and I hadn't noticed this huge peak in front of me until I reached the yeah. previous peak. And I go, oh, my goodness. You know, and, and so I would kind of get this spiritual pride, which is not a good thing. But what I would say is that, number one, don't feel guilty or don't be hard on yourself that you don't feel like you're moving forward or, or moving deeper into your spiritual life. That happens, like I said, to a lot of people. I know my own experience, it, it happens. It keeps happening. It's still happening from time to time. And basically just keep praying, you know. Keep doing the things you're doing, and even if it doesn't feel like anything is happening, doesn't feel like you're moving closer to Jesus, uh, learning more about your faith, becoming more spiritual, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Don't don't knock yourself, don't make yourself feel guilty and, and, and get in, into a, a rut because of the rut. Um, just hang with it, like I said, keep praying, pray the rosary, and, and keep reading the Bible. And don't worry about how you feel, just keep doing the things you know you're supposed to be doing, the, the mass attendance, going to confession, uh, regularly and so forth, and it, it will come. Yeah. It will come. Uh, in fact, we take Jesus' advice when he gave the evangelical counsels to his followers of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving right. as, as three uh, streams of our spiritual growth. You have prayer, and if we look at the prayer of the church, the prayer of the church in the daily office, the liturgy, and also the sacraments have to do with uh, receiving grace, praying to God, and spiritual readings. So there's the part of the prayer. If we look at fasting, is recognizing that our our spiritual journey always involves the disciplining of our lives for the rest of our lives. And fasting involves making choices, sacrifices, to train our our spirit and our body to be vessels of God. So that's always an important part. If we're in a dry spell, we have to look at our, our right. lives and look at what are the distractions in my life that are pulling me away from God. Yes. All right. And then the almsgiving is our constant challenge to be givers, giving to others, being channels of God's love. In fact, uh, I think it was St. Benedict that calls us to be reservoirs. In other words, it's the overflow of our spiritual growth that should be flowing to others. So the danger is that when we go through dry spells, and, and Patrick, we're all there. I mean, we all go through it. Yes. And I would say, even <laughs> if you can't pray, if you feel you're not praying, just say, God, I want to pray. Uh, you know, I pray. My prayer is that you help me to pray. And then forget about it. And what you'll find is that a couple hours later, you'll be in your car, your office, and you'll stop and you'll say a prayer or something, you know, because of grace. And it, it's something you can't force. Just don't try to force it. Just like you said, keep doing the things you're supposed to be doing, yeah. and God will, will provide the graces. All right, let's let's take this email from a father of three in Newark, Ohio. That's boy, that's not far from where I live. John, many students, including <clears throat> Catholic high school students, go off to college not knowing their faith, especially when confronted by humanist teachers. Are there any collected resources to help our kids be ready to defend their faith when they go off to college? So part of the problem here is. Again, we presume our young people have picked it up along the way, and then we send them forth, and then they go to a college. And sometimes colleges, we presume, are good, safe places to be, but there is no safe place. Right. So resources, for example. Well, um, there's a book that uh, I haven't personally read, but I, I've uh, had a young lady who worked with, with me this summer at the radio station, and uh, I asked her to read this book. I, I think it's a Philadelphia Catholic in King James Court which is written as a novel, but it's apologetics mm -hmm. all through it. And uh, uh, she read it, she's 18, she's, just, she's now uh, finishing up her first semester at college, and she loved it. She loved the book, she said it was, it was great, she learned a lot of things from it. So uh, books like that, um, tapes, you know, maybe not uh, starting off with, say, a Scott Hahn, who's, who's, who's very uh, knowledgeable, yes, yeah. very intense, uh, but uh, 
go to the if there's a Catholic bookstore nearby, and, and in Newark, I, I believe there is a Catholic bookstore. I've been up there. Um, go down there and ask them. Say what tapes, what yeah. books are good for teenagers. Uh, you know, books on the saints especially are good for teenagers to read. Saint Francis of Assisi, uh, and so forth. And um, in fact, I know in Newark there's a there's a good church there, uh, Saint Francis de Sales. It has a book. A book table right outside yeah, the sanctuary. I, I so I mean, it. there there's a place. Two things I would recommend are um, there's a new set of uh, faith flashcards that are put out by yes. uh, Ascension <laughs> Press that are designed specifically for young people to teach them, to challenge them to learn the faith. They're excellent cards, and I highly recommend those. And um, there's also that wonderful book that Catholic Answers puts out, Pillar of Fire, Pillar of Truth, that was originally written to uh, strengthen the faith of our young people when they went away. To the um, the annual uh, to the youth conference youth conferences with the Holy Father every mm -hmm. year to strengthen them in case they're being challenged by those outside the faith. So and uh, those are and one other thing, you know, not not to engage in shameless self promotion, but the, <laughs> the talks that I've done, I keep things very simple. I'm I'm not a scholar. I don't have deep theological training and everything. And I've had people, uh, uh, a woman who bought some of my tapes. Has a 16-year-old daughter, a woman in South Carolina, and she said her daughter babysat for this uh, evangelical Protestant woman, and the Protestant woman was always asking questions about the Catholic faith, and and daughter never had any responses, and they ordered my tapes. The daughter, they're they're easy enough for high school kids to learn, yeah. to listen to, and learn. And the mother wrote me a nice note one day, said my daughter was brought home from babysitting the other day. And they sat in the driveway for, I think, almost an hour as her daughter evangelized yeah. this woman she'd been babysitting for. So find tapes like that that, uh, you know, listen to them, see how they are. If, if they're simple, not too complex, give them to the kids. Although the high school kids can understand a lot more right. than That's right. what we give I, them credit for. I wanted to say on the one hand, there's no silver bullet. You right. Know, it's not something you just give them and figure it's going to guarantee. We can never presume that. On the other hand, uh, the old stuff, the Baltimore Catechism oh, yeah. stuff is still good. I yes. mean, it, it, sadly, we've, we've gotten this idea that the new is better than the old. Yes. No, it isn't. Uh, and the old foundations of the Baltimore, Baltimore Catechism, the basics are, that are there, in fact, planted the seeds for you that later came to yes. fruition, even though there was mm -hmm. 13, 15 years in between, it was those same yes, seeds. Yes, absolutely. Let's take our next caller, Anthony from New York. What's your question for us tonight? Hi, guys. Hey. Um, I was an evangelical um, itinerant preacher for a very, very long time and uh, had left that and gotten involved with Buddhism, yeah. uh, the occult, the New Age movement, and have been on a search really for truth and have been attempting to come back to the Catholic Church, uh, to the teaching of the Church. And my journey was uh, rather rudely interrupted uh, a few weeks ago by coming across a couple of books, one by uh, Hans Kung, yeah. another one by Karen Armstrong, uh, The History of God. These people, as you know, are very highly educated. They have PhDs galore. Uh, and my question is, you know, is it that? I mean, Kung doesn't even believe in the Trinity. Neither yeah. does Armstrong. Yeah. The, my question is, because they have PhDs, is it just that they have found something that the church is not willing to face? Are they seeing it correctly? I'm not talking specifically about the doctrine of the Trinity so right. much as the fact that they have PhDs and they're presenting something that, you know, are, are they right? Because Thank you, Patrick. We didn't mean to cut you off, but we want to, we think you got your question. It was a good question. I appreciate that well, very and, much. And I understand that. The thing, the problem is, you have people with PhDs, sometimes one or two PhDs, who all disagree. Yeah. So obviously education and more education and more education doesn't necessarily lead you to the truth. Exactly. And uh, you know, I think there's something about Jesus talking about to, um, you know, the little children, you know, let the little children come unto me. And, and if you read the lives of the saints, so many of the saints who were not educated some of the, uh, I think the curé of ours, you know, they, they wouldn't let him become a priest for a long time because he didn't have the education. But he was one of the most holiest people around and because of his holiness, his prayer, God gave him graces to know the truth and to share the truth in such a way that he converted 
literally tens of thousands of people. And, you know, it, truth, what he said about searching for truth, that was the whole thing that played all through, which I, I we didn't really mention, but all through my life. What is the truth? Yeah. And when I started searching for truth, you start coming up to the arguments of the Catholic Church, and you've got 2,000 years, as I mentioned before, of, of Anselm, Augustine, Aquinas, uh, uh, St. Teresa, all of these doctors and saints of the church that it's just incredible what is there. And so a Hans Kuhn and, and others like that that are Catholic in name but are teaching against what the church teaches, the old, the old saying is, uh, where Peter is, there is the church. That's the thing I came to, because I was confused by people on the right as well as people on the left, and it kept coming back to, would God make it so difficult for me to find the truth that I have to know Latin or be able to go into Vatican II documents and figure out the originals and all? No, no, God would not do that. He built his church on the rock of Peter. Who is Peter's successor? And what does he say? And that's how I calm my mind and my soul and said, what the Catholic Church teaches through its vicar of Christ here on earth, that's the truth and nothing else can shake me from that. In fact, uh, Patrick, I'm glad of that question because um, this is a problem that's been around since the beginning of the church, beginning of time. People with opinions. And we, we tend to trust those that seem to be more educated. They seem to sound like they know what's talking about there. We trust them. But the, the problem is that are they infallible? Are they inspired? By what voice are they speaking? To what extent is their own hang-ups, their own, the burden on their back, sh uh, shaping what they're teaching? Reminded of a scripture in 2 Timothy 4 that says, sounds very prophetic to our day, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having mm. itchy ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. Uh, just because someone has a PhD does not mean that they've got a corner on the truth. And that's the right. danger has always been this move from the apostles and the apostolic succession of the church to the theologian. The pressure has been the theologian speak for the church. Now, specifically for you, Patrick, I have a book I'd like to recommend to you. This isn't for everyone's journey, but it's for yours. It's called Moody Buddhist Catholic I'll by bon a man by the name of John Case who went through a very difficult time bouncing back and forth, struggling for the truth, well-educated, time as a Muni, time as a Buddhist, time in New Age, found his way back to the church. And I recommend it specifically for you and your journey. And I like there's a thing Alice Von Hillebrand, I've heard her say, talking about people with PhDs, she said, God put limits on our intelligence, but he didn't put any limits on our stupidity. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the truth. Or our pride, yes. which is you know, maybe one of the biggest problems. Are. We repeat that title again specifically for you, Patrick. It's called Moody Buddhist Catholic by John Case. It's a, it's a story of a journey. And uh, I'm going to say that there's some rough parts of the story because he's telling a story as yeah. it is. But I think because of your journey, I'd recommend that to you, Patrick. John, important question I ask every week, which to me is one of the most significant things, and that is in your return to the church. In what ways has it drawn you closer to Jesus? Well, I, I, I don't know. When I was out of the church, I don't know how I could have been farther away from Jesus than I was. And coming into the church, the church is the body of Christ. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the deeper you get into the church, into her teachings, the deeper you're getting into the body of Christ, into the teachings of Jesus Christ. Because that's all the Catholic Church is. It, it's, it's Jesus present in time for us, you know, as he was kind of back almost 2,000 years ago. And he's continuing. And, you know, the, the Eucharist, the sacraments, the, the grace that you get from all of those, that is the very life of God that is coming to us through those sacraments. And to be able to go to a chapel and have Jesus present right there in front of you, you know, I don't know how you can get any closer to Jesus Christ than you can through the Catholic Church. And, you know, I've come a long way, 
but I recognize I've got a long way to Still go. Journey, that's right. so. and, the, and the importance of the church, to, because in our praying and intimacy with Jesus, we have so many voices that try and tell us who Jesus is. Right. We've got to have, make sure we're praying to the right Jesus. Exactly. And understanding him in a, in a Trinitarian sense, because yes. of all the other voices. John, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. It's a great pleasure. It's and also, God privilege. bless you in your radio ministry. And, thank uh, you. As it's intent, possibly, to move closer to Birmingham, so more people can hear you, right? We're, we're hoping and praying. We're hoping. Everybody needs to pray for that. Thank you, John. Uh, stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment for some final words for the journey home. Welcome back. One of the emails we couldn't get to that I want to make a comment about was challenge, asking John what was the biggest issue that he often received from anti-Catholics. And the one thing he wanted to point out was that what we have to be careful is the danger of assuming that anyone that writes in the name of Catholicism represents the church. And that's the biggest danger as our last caller mentioned a Catholic theologian that in reality his books don't represent the church. And so the importance is, if you want to know what the church teaches, don't read a book written by an anti-Catholic or someone that has a, you know, a chip on the shoulder. Read something that represents the magisterium of the church. But I want to draw, in closing, uh, an important text to you that challenges you and I to know our faith. And, of course, it's 1 Peter 3.15. We've said it many times. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. So we're called to to know our faith and to give a reason for it. But around that text are other, a couple other important verses. Right before it, it says that in your hearts reverence Christ as Lord. It isn't just mental knowledge, but it's heart conversion and knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. We're called to do that. Afterwards, it says we are to do our defense of our faith with gentleness and reverence. We are to do it with love. We aren't to use our faith as a cudgel, but to love others because the great gift we're giving them is the love of Christ. And then it says that we are to keep our conscience clear. We are to walk in holiness. Converted mind, converted heart, and converted life so that our, our giving is a giving of Jesus. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. I'll see you then again next week.